Good morning, everyone. I am just getting organized and I will be with you momentarily. Um, so um, I'm going to put it into the chat. And here's Craig. Hello, Craig. Welcome. It's nice to have you with me. Uh, we have a we have a guest panelist here, uh, or not a guest really, a, a longtime friend. But I can't hear you yet, Craig. And um, nor can I see you. Anyway, um, what we're doing for today is we're continuing on with the precursors to uh, synchronicity. And and we are on page uh, 496 of the of volume eight and we are at page 80 of this book uh the synchronicity book that's currently available that does this separately okay uh so i will just begin to read and uh here's jyoti ah good Good morning, Jyoti. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm just beginning with a paragraph 933, which is the best I can remember where we were uh, when, uh, when we finished last week. So I will begin to read and we'll see what that where that takes us. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little disheveled this morning because I ended up in uh, two important calls to India, believe it or not. And so <laughs> here we go. Okay, paragraph 933. Um, all right, so he's talking about uh, earlier versions of synchronicity in other systems. And so here, here's what he's talking about for psychology and alchemy. What this means for alchemy, I have shown in some detail in my psychology and Al alchemy book. Okay. Johannes Kepler thought in much the same way. He says in his Tertius Intervenience from 1610, quote, this that is a geometrical uh morning jordan nice to see you this morning um uh, this that is a geometrical pr uh, principle underlying the physical world uh close parents is also according to the doctrine of aristotle the strongest tie that links the lower world to the heavens and unifies it therewith so that all its forms are governed from on high. But in this lower world, that is to say the globe of the earth, there is inherent a spiritual nature capable of geometria, which ex instinctu creatoris sine forces through the geometrical and harmonious combination of the heavenly rays of the light, whether all plants and animals, as well as uh, the globe of the earth, have this faculty in themselves, I cannot say. But it, it is not an unbelievable thing. For in all th these things, that is, in the fact that flowers have a definite color, form, and number of petals, close parentheses, there is at work the instinctus divinus rationus participants and not at all 
man's own intelligence. That man, too, through his soul and its lower faculties, has a like affinity to the heavens, as has the soil of the earth can be tested and proven in many ways. Okay, what I'm, I think he's saying here is uh, more or less, and you correct me if I'm wrong, panelists or uh, fellow uh, followers on the YouTube chat, uh, what I think he's saying is that there are systems in the universe above and below that all work together and they can be described mathematically, geometrically, and in other ways, in other forms, um, but they all work together. And as of now, human beings haven't figured everything out. So he was writing, Kepler was writing in 1610, and we, uh, in 2022, so 412 years later, uh, we basically don't have anything better to say than that, that um, everything that happens, whether it's plant or animal or human being, is com connected to everything else that happens, or um, every atom in the universe is connected to every other atom in the universe, and therefore they all work according to a specific law, uh, which we have not fully comprehended yet. We've comprehended a heck of a lot since 16 then, but not everything. Uh, and as a result of that, we do not yet um, know the connection uh, to um, quantum mechanics between uh, Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics. We still don't understand that fully. And good morning, Art. Good morning, uh, Patrick Hollywood. And um, so we, we still don't understand that connection. And as we've seen in all of Jungian work, uh, there's a, there's, our, is a whole universe within us, and we have 8 billion of them in the world right now. And each of our unconscious universes is slightly different because we've all come through different uh, pathways to be right here, right now. Okay, we're all here right now. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so, as a result of the fact that we're all here right now, something has directed us all to be here right now. Um, and so whatever path we've taken to get here, we're here now. And we've found a intersection of our lives, if you will. Um, and this is what I think Kepler is trying to get at here. Um, and you know, if I was wearing a, a flower in my, in my uh, collar here, uh, like a lapel flower, um, that flower would have taken a certain direction to get here as well. And, and obviously the image of Carl Jung's Bollingen behind me uh, is another example that got here not only because of me, but because of what Carl Jung did in his life over a 50-year period when he built this thing. He built that building, Bollingen, basically with his bare hands, with a little help from some workmen, uh, but he, he envisioned it. And it's only because of Carl Jung's life, this is part of his legacy, that he left this building for us and the legacy of the people who invented photography made it possible. And the people that invented computers and the internet, all of their legacies are all intersect right here, right now, so that we can be seeing this anywhere in the world. And so that's the point of this paragraph, I think. Jordan, did you have something to say here? 
Yeah, I, I fully agree with you because quantum mechanics, Newtonian physics, math, arithmetic, philosophy, I, I, I call it the vitamin K principle. I mean, it's all capital N nature and they're all attempts to describe nature. And I say vitamin K because potassium, for example, vitamin K, if you have lung issues, you should eat bananas for potassium or other things for potassium because there is something missing in artificially produced, produced vitamin K, potassium, that actually can destroy someone's lungs if they have lung issues, which means it's not fully nature, not fully yeah. natural. So I think the natural versus artificial, and I don't, I don't mean to say artificial in a derogatory manner towards quantum mechanics or Newtonian physics, but in every generation or in every century, there's simply another way to try to more robustly imitate nature and actually make nature. Whereas I think then the creative principle, art, that's how we create nature. And I think the, the mathematics and the physics, the formulas and such are great, but they're kind of like an infinitely segmented circle, lots of little straight lines, where in oh. nature, the circle doesn't have any straight lines. It is a continuously changing direction arc. And so right. the approximation versus actual is, I think, important. In respect to all those things, um, scientists, we and scientists are only observers, okay? Right. We're only observing what things do if certain conditions are in place. So Newtonian physics demonstrates very first of all gravity, uh, of course. So Newton observed the apple falling from the tree and realized that there was some force in the universe that was causing us to stick to the earth and not fly out into space. And, um, and so no, ha no matter how infinitesimal we get, it, we're still only observers. So when you talk about CERN and the, the large, uh, what do you call it? The, the cyclotron. Super, super collider. Super collider. <laughs> Excuse me. The super collider in Switzerland. It's 17 miles long. It's a, in a circle. Uh, that uses a hell of a lot of machinery to simply observe what's happening at the smallest level. And so now that has proven that there is the Higgs boson that had never been proven before. And is that the smallest thing? Well, yeah, maybe we, we don't really know. But even if, even if we agreed that it was the smallest thing, um, we would still only be observing it. And we, and we require a multi-billion dollar piece of gear to even observe it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and with respect to quantum mechanics, it's the same thing. We, we observe phenomena, um, but that's all. We don't force phenomena to do anything they don't want to do. <laughs> no matter how big yeah. or no matter how small, nature is nature and nature is going, will have its way. <laughs> you know, and if I, yes, definitely. And if I, if I play a game of shifting focus and redirecting scale, if I look at an atom and its neurons and its protons orbiting, that's a little baby solar system. True. And all the space between <clears throat> invisible gravity, or as I call it, orbital synapse, you know, between them is just as important as the things themselves. Exactly. And we end up with all of these atoms that are composed into this orbital structure that looks like us, that is composed of all these little galaxies of right. organs and other things. And what's interesting to me is if I have a thought, then a neuron or neurons have fired across this little baby abyss of the synapse, the nothingness, the void. Right. And in that thought, that synapse is approximately 50% of the equation, you know, the not knowing, and in a sense, the space between a note and another one. And when it lands on the other neuron, 
there is that space to find between the, no the notes, but I don't need to describe it other than capital and nothingness. And it's still at that point with two neurons in a synapse, it's one third of the equation. So like you said, if we're observers and we're only describing basically what we observe, what we perceive, what we experience, understanding not so much, oh yeah, let's look at dark matter. Well, then you're looking at dark matter as the thing and ignoring the other things that are actually objects. And so I find that in any situation, instead of all intellect, just a lot of neurons, you have to have just as many synapses, just as many breathing room spaces or the space between the heartbeats or even- right. and, and so as, it, as with empty space in our universe, um, we, can, we can only observe what is happening with things that we can somehow experience through our senses mm -hmm. and and uh there may be lots of things going on that we can't experience through our senses uh as the uh, james webb telescope is now showing us in the infrared zone it's seeing things in the universe that we've never seen before but they've always been there right and mm -hmm. Uh, on Friday, when I was coming home from work and the sun was very low in the sky at this time of the winter, the sun tends to get very low in the, su in the sky or fall, let's say, uh, because the sun is out over the, uh, the southern hemisphere. <clears throat> and as I'm going over this one bridge across the Severn River, I cannot see. The sun is right in my face and I can't even block it out because I, then I can't see where I'm driving. And I got to one point uh, on this bridge on Friday <laughs> where I, I my vision was so blocked out that I thought about pulling over to the side and just waiting three minutes until the sun moved away a little bit so that I could see where I was going. Uh, I was literally sun, sun blind at that point. Uh, and those, my point was that those particles or waves, those photons or waves coming into my eyes have been traveling for eight and a half minutes uh, yeah. from, from the sun. Uh, and I put my hand up and they're being blocked by my hand. Um, but, oh, my God, uh, you know, we can experience those things in our senses, sometimes quite painfully, uh, but we can't change them. We can block them by blocking our eyes, but then we can't see what we're doing. Well, yeah, I remember on actually, of all things, too, on a, on a bridge. And, you know, 15, 20 miles an hour, really slow because, I mean, it was full on light blind. Yeah. And I remember a friend of mine's like, why, why did you open your door? And I said, I need to drive by seeing the rails outside the car yeah. instead of where I'm going. Because I'm, I'm sitting there watching the white line to stay enough over so that I know my perception is this spot in the lane predicting that no one's going to be coming the other way passing something and the, and the car in front of you isn't going to stop on the isn't going to stop exactly and so there's right. i'm like you need you need to try to watch off to the side or down and tell me if anyone slows down too much and just say you know red alert or you know beep beep car or car um because i can't trust um what i see by looking at the track so to speak or the rails of the white line and I, I can't predict um, what someone else's effect is going to be. Is right. there, are they doing the same thing or are they driving just hoping, you know? I yeah. mean, so so, yeah, so na nothing. nature is nature. And I think we've probably chewed this one to death right now, but uh, nature is nature and we're not changing it. We're observing it no matter what it is, whether we need uh, the, you know, the super collider, we need a microscope or we need to block our eyes. We're just observing. We, we can't change it, uh, really. 
Uh, well, and like you said, sometimes you'll say a small thing that then changes something in a whole system. Right. And, and, like and, the butterfly principle, you know, it flaps. That's the right. So, so exactly. So here we have Jung's house and whether that building remains for another 500 years, which it may well do, uh, it's it's not the rocks that make the difference. It's the fact of Jung's life, which caused that. And why did he do that? Who, what, when, where, why, how? Um, but that's the legacy of his life in the same sense that this video is our legacy even after we're gone to the future so that others can work these things out. So let's let's go on with the next paragraph because that gets to the other side of it, which is the astrological. So uh, uh, go ahead, Jordan. I will. One quick comment too, I think to take your Bollingen, you know, the Bollingen series piece, the house, one step further is it's stone. So it's been around for millions of years, but now it's stone put in that form Yep. If I amplify that one step further and think Machu Picchu and Incan megalithic walls, people always say, what are these crazy pentagonal you know, five-sided shapes? They're small and large. And what's interesting is that they're not crazy shapes. Natural maize, natural corn is not all regular like we have corn on the cob. Natural mm -hmm. maize has all of those shapes, large and small. And what happens is Think about that. That's an incredibly high seismic zone. And right. it and has not moved one eye. Oh, it moves, but it doesn't break up because it's in a literally and in a natural form that's scaled up. So if you look at natural corn cobs, that's the structure of those walls. And they've lasted for thousands of years. Yeah. Right. And uh, Kathy makes a good point here. Uh, she says, also, we are nature. The collective blinders to what to that is an issue for humanity. And I said, yep, but a big one. And, you know, the point of us being nature is what what is the meaning of our lives? What is the meaning of your life? Well, um, the meaning of my life in part is this YouTube channel, which I hope the videos from this YouTube channel will survive for hundreds of years but even if they don't the energy that comes off these videos even if you're not listening live right now um, the energy that comes off these vid videos influences the energy in your life every person who's listening influences the energy in your life and that gets passed on you know, E equals MC squared. So <clears throat> that energy will continue until it becomes um, mass again, somehow. Right. And so in Jung's case, the energy of his life was converted into the mass of Bollingen. And that mass uh, may go out in various energetic forms. One of them is through the form of this video. Um, and so, uh, you know, that goes back to Einstein and E equals MC squared. So uh, the, the meaning of your life is what, how the energies of your life are passed along through uh, our species and through the other species, because obviously the energy of our lives cause us to uh, slaughter billions of cattle and, and chickens and <laughs> pigs every year. And the energy of their lives uh, comes into us. So for example, when we, when I, I just made an omelet for my wife. And so the chicken that delivered those four eggs that we had in that omelet um, and four plus, because we also had egg beaters in it. Um, the energy from from those eggs uh, didn't become as uh, baby chickens as perhaps the mother chicken intended, but they actually became human beings. And so, um, as the Buddhist would say, uh, you only be you know coming into a human life 
is like coming up in a life preserver in the middle of the ocean that's floating in the middle of the ocean and you're able to come up in that one little circle and there therefore you have a human life but lives go on the energy of our lives go on and the legacy of our lives go on and the legacy of those chickens that uh, delivered those four plus eggs uh, this morning um, also goes on in a different way. And, well, and what's interesting with your number four there, you know, the house <clears throat> behind you, Young's yeah. home, there's this one differentiated stone body underneath, this natural mm -hmm. construction underneath four psychological functions of roof forms that I see. And what's interesting is that one, two, three, four, they're all connected. They're all independent. And they're also all interdependent because right. they're all roofs on the same psyche, so to speak, or the same home. Right. And um, this long, na long name of, uh, I don't know, MPGIS, BTS, Army B, uh, Bay Fighting. Uh, says, and uh, I'm going to in the future refer to you as M MPG. It takes too long to describe the, your your uh, acronym here, but um, I think our lives collectively will be more difficult in the future. And the truth of that is very true because um, you know in Western civilization especially to include the united states we've had the luxury of being able to harvest uh, the fruits of the world to create the lifestyle that we live in in, in this generation uh, but you know what has become clear is that if everybody in the world lived the way americans do uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible. It would weigh three times the earth or something like that. And so that's not going to happen. And uh, and so, you know, there is going to be a more difficult future for humanity. How that plays out, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's a process that's going to take thousands of years. And uh, so... Well, Kathy that says that I must show just a moment. Uh, I love the line in the movie Cold Mountain. Seeds got job. Birds got a job. Shit's got a job. Absolutely. Uh, MPG is fine. Okay. So anyway. Um, so everything has, has a natural job to do. And, you know... Um, one time I I was ruminating to Deb a long while ago, um, you know, that I, I couldn't imagine just having a gravestone because, you know, who would come and see my gravestone and care anything about it or know anything about what my gravestone meant or my life meant by visiting a, a cemetery? And she says, well, make your own memorial. And so mm -hmm. that's what I've been doing ever since, including in this conversation. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, after I go on to the beyond, I won't be underneath the gravestone. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, 934. Yeah, go go for it, please. Concerning, <clears throat> concerning the astrological, in quotes, character, in essence, astrological synchronicity, Kepler says, the character is received, not into the body, which is much too inappropriate for this, but into the soul's own nature, which behaves like a point for which reason it can also be transformed into the point of the confluxus radiorum. This nature of the soul not only partakes of their reason, on a, parenthetically, on account of which we human beings are called reasonable above other living creatures, close parents, but also has another innate reason enabling it 
to apprehend instantaneously without long learning the geometrium in the radius or radii as well as the vocibus, that is to say, in music, musica. Thirdly, another marvelous thing is that the nature which receives the characterim, characterim also, reduce, also induces a certain correspondence in constellationibus celestibus in its relatives or celestial constellations. When a mother is great with child and the natural time of delivery is near, nature selects for the birth a day and hour which correspond on account of the heavens from an astro astrological point of view to the nativity of the mother's brother or father. And this known qual non qualitative said astronomy astronomies a quantitative not qualitative is quantitative uh, fourthly so well does each nature know not only its character in celestium but also the celestium configurations <laughs> celestial configurations and courses of every day that whenever a planet moves depresenti into its characteristics Characteristic sentinum or loca precipa, precipua, especially into the natalitia, natality, birth, it responds to this and is affected and stimulated, whereby in various ways. And footnote is simply a reference to a number. So, um, so to me, that's, you know, there's your natal okay. chart. As yeah, you said, let, let's, let's, let's just, I'll try to read this last paragraph fourthly in plain in English yeah, so that everybody knows. Uh, fourthly, <laughs> so well does our, each nature know not only its character, character in the universe, but also its celestial configuration and courses of every day that whatever a planet moves uh, and presents itself into the characteristic ascendance or local or participates in a locality, especially into the into nature, it responds to this and is affected and stimulated thereby in various ways. Okay, so again, he's saying basically what we were saying during our commentary here, which is in alchemy, Alchemy is only observing again uh, what what happens when something when this or that happens, and uh, you know, let's take magnetism for example. Magnetism was discovered by alchemists, and uh, when people when humans were still quite ignorant about the way magnetism works. Uh, an alchemist could demonstrate the ordering of filings on a paper with the magnet underneath it, for example, mm -hmm. or, or a piece of stone that was magnetic underneath it. And it, it would seem magic, but it was only that the alchemist already knew what the relationship was between the magnet and the, and the iron filings. Uh, that would be on top of the paper. And this is where I, ideas of magic uh, originated. They originated because some human beings knew things about how nature works that others did not. And the result was that they were able to seem magic, woo wee woo, magic. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, but really, there's no such thing except in the mind of man or humanity. And so uh, all, all it means is the audience was more ignorant than the alchemist. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I think that brings up two things. One, Aquarius, the water bearer, astrologically is an air sign. But where does the water come from? Well, the magic of understanding condensation and water pot particles in the air they condensate water to basically cons constellate the water molecules 
to come together and pour out water from thin air. And the second piece, when you say the, you know, the whenever a planet moves into the Natalitia, in plain English, I could use the word militia, a group of people, and a marshalling of forces of a group of people. And Natalitia would be the marshalling of the planets in the natal chart rather than just nature. And I think what happens then is you get that planetary, as you said, magnetism of how all of these magnetic orbital inertia bodies in the galaxy, et cetera, directly affect the person from that point forward. Right. And, and there's zillions of processes. Okay. So I was talking about my omelet this morning. So uh, my wife and I eat the omelet and you know, a zillion processes take place re in our bodies that we know nothing about really until the, the refuse of it, the part of it that we don't use in our own energy uh, is evacuated from our bodies. Uh, and, um, and only then are we aware of it once again. And this happens all the time with anything we eat. And so all those processes are taken, uh, taking place and all, you know, every process in the universe works that way. Uh, you know, it, it, it's all going on. The processes that hold the molecules together of Bollingen are still going on and they're going on very effectively. And probably they'll go on for another 500 years before the the building actually collapses, but even when it collapses, it will still be present because it's it's memorialized in so many photographs. And well, yeah, go that's ahead. a great that's a great example because I by synchronicity I, I saw a cartoon this week, and there's this this like 97 year old man, and he's sitting there and he's got a, a glass of wine and a shot of vodka and a beer in front of him. And he's just alternating and as they're talking and the guy says, well, is retirement difficult? He said, well, I didn't really retire. I just do this now. And they said, well, what does beer, vodka and, and, and wine have to do with retirement? He goes, I was a biochemical engineer. So now I'm just really good at transforming wine, beer and vodka into urine. <laughs> <laughs> right. he, said, he said just right. nobody pays me for it so it's like so right so all these processes are taking right. place all the time we have i don't know how many cells we have in our bodies but it's certainly in the billions um and these cells are constantly changing okay and we're unaware of all that activity, even though those processes are constantly taking place. And they're taking place everywhere in the universe, if you think about it. And, and so when, when unions get derisive about scientists, they say, well, scientists hold all variables constant except for one. And then they find out what the result is when all variables are constant except for one. But so they get to decide what's on the table, but they're not even consider, considering all these minuscule processes that are always happening in everything. And so, yes, at a macro level, we, we've learned a lot from the scientific method, so-called. But what what Jung is trying to get at is that there are processes going on all the time. And what we have learned and what we are learning about uh, things like schizophrenia, and we will be having a, a wisdom path uh, session about this book, The Schizophrenia Complex, uh, on the 21st of January uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, what we're learning about schizophrenia is that the energies that go out from schizophrenia also f affect everybody around schizophrenia. And uh, I've certainly seen it. I've seen it happen in, in many people that um, 
I I know, and it's affected them quite dramatically. And and yet you can recover from that because the human being is able to recover uh, from a schizophrenia complex. Um, but schizophrenia itself is a is a process. So if we isolate that process, there may be ways that we can uh, ameliorate it. And obviously we do with certain drugs, uh, with people who actually have schizophrenia. Uh, I don't know how full of a life those people have, but nonetheless, um, they, you know, these are all processes everywhere. This process is everywhere you look. And you know, all we can do by education is learn a few um, processes around the edges and hope that we get the ones that are important to keep us alive and live our lives and have a meaning to our life at the end of it. So go well, ahead. Well, yeah, I think that I, your example of the, you know, scientists holding the variables constant except for one reminds me of electron mis microscopy, you know, the electron microscope, where you have a particle and it has a position, a direction, and a velocity, but you have to choose which one you're going to screw up to get information about the other two. Because if you, if you hit it in such a way to, to find its position, then you're going to lose either the direction or the velocity because you're going to alter it. So you can, in a sense, I don't know now if they can do more, but with the electron microscope initially, it was plotting the direction, plotting the direction and the velocity or the position and the direction or the position and the velocity, but they always messed up one in the quote unquote observation of influencing it to try to discern what its magnetism would tell them. And right. if we can just have a TV screen and watch it in real time at that micro scale, then we can see the whole picture instead of the, oh, well, we don't know what's going on. Well, in one of the ones where you had a velocity that had an anomaly, maybe you were screwing up velocity. So you didn't notice the natural anomaly in the movement. So you, you plot this nicely organized you know, path when in reality it does this, you know, yeah, and, right. and you miss right when you do that, you miss that little important DNA right. heartbeat of it. Right. So anyway, it's, it's all happening all the time is, right. is, is the answer. Okay. I'll let, read on. I think we've uh, chewed this one pretty well. Yep. Uh, paragraph 935 Kepler supposes that the secret of the marvelous correspondence is to be found in the earth because the earth is animated by the anima tellurus uh, for, the, for whose existence he adduces a number of proofs. Among these are the constant temperature below the surface of the earth, the peculiar power of the earth soul to produce metals, minerals, and fossils, namely the fact, the forming faculties, uh, which is similar to that of the womb and can bring forth in the bowels of the earth shapes that are otherwise found only outside. Ships, fishes, kings, popes, monks, soldiers, etc. Further the practice of geometry for it produces the five geometrical bodies and the six cornered figures in crystals. The animal anima tellurus has all this from an original impulse independent of the reflection and re uh, ratiocination of man. Okay, so uh, we as human beings are able to sort of comprehend what he's talking about fairly directly. Um, and But human beings before our time definitely were unable to. And so we are gradually having more and more knowledge that tells us more and more about how all these processes occur. Uh, and it's all alchemy, okay? Including how human beings interact. And of course, that's where we get psychology and uh, how human beings can be mentally ill and that's psychiatry. 
so we we know more and mo more about how all these things work, but in the end, they're all processes that occur. And so if someone is born to be a natural schizophrenic, uh, I'm sorry, that's a process that began uh, billions of years ago. It began at the Big Bang, and it it ends in the fetus that's born to be schizophrenic. And, and that's a process that has never stopped since that time. Uh, now, whether there was something before the Big Bang, you know, we just don't have the capability to look back before the Big Bang. Um, and, and so nobody can say, but what we can say fairly surely is, is it's not an old man in a beard floating <laughs> along above our, our clouds as it was envisioned right. in ancient times. So, um, so we have to decide, you know, decide for ourselves. I mean, we, we create God in our image. We aren't created in God's image. We create God in our, our image and we're, we're constantly doing that. And ultimately we, probably change over time and what has happened in the development of the human race is yes different religions have come up but they all point to the same thing and they all solve the same questions and and so they're just different ways of looking at the same problem uh as you know as is you know as different as uh looking through Galileo's telescope or looking through the James Webb telescope, <laughs> you know, who knows who's got the better way of doing it. We all have ways of doing it, but now we have to understand that all those ways are pointing to the same things. And, and we, we shouldn't be killing one another over the differences in, in, um, in how we look at religion and how we look at those forms. Yeah, I think that brings up that, you know, God as a divine rational rationalization to give us a foundation or a buoy. And with that in the paragraph, you know, the constant temperature below the surface of the earth, well, otherwise known as the frost line. So if I'm at certain elevation, I'm gonna have to go down four, five feet, six, whatever it is, before I can have the base of my foundation on constant temperature earth to provide support for the structure I build above it. But if I take it out to the ocean, an oil rig, do I have propellers on motors on either side all over that constantly fire differently to keep it stationary or relatively in the same location? Or do I drop down a long tube of a pile or cables or if I go switch the ocean to the Arctic, then I'm not gonna find that bedrock or that constant temperature. What I need to do is utilize the ice as a relative solid. And I can either hook it like tents, you know, just with cables and darts, so to speak on the surface, but that's more dangerous because it doesn't protect it from intense wind loading from one side, like a certain gust. Right. And it's but, yeah, as Manaloa shows, right? As Manaloa shows us, uh, we better be careful how deep, deeply we drill, um, because um, we just don't know the actual thickness of the mantle uh, every place on the planet, and so. And it's streaky, you know. I mean, right. like I live. In Taos, we were on what 200, 250 feet of bedrock, right. where Santa Fe is on over an obsidian plate. But here, there's more exposed bedrock than there, and it's a whole different foundation situation and a whole different energy here. And right. then, if I say go back to the Arctic, sometimes I'd have to drill piles deep enough that the just the skin friction of the whatever the pile material the found the pier is on the ice causes a distribution of the force to hold it steady right. so like you know we don't know also utilizing that 
like you said, with how far we drill or where we drill, all the fracking creates micro fissures, right. both, both vertically and at an angle to get to those lower places. And then horizontally, basically cracking whole shelves open. And who, who's to say what that does? And then the sinkholes form. And is there a relationship to the sinkhole a thousand miles away to that? I don't know. But right. well, and, and, and we don't, we don't, when we frack, we don't necessarily know what we're doing. Okay. Because right. if we frack and we happen to hit a place where the mantle is quite thin, we could create a volcano very easily. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I know I was involved in some law up in upstate New York where, um, the Foster Salt Company is. And uh, there are two counties in Western New York. Uh, one of them is Monroe County. I think one is Erie County, which are entirely uh, under undergirded by a salt bed. And so, and this is centered, this activity, the salt mining basically is centered on a town called Retsoff, uh, and Retsoff is Foster spelled backwards, okay, <laughs> and, and so what the big controversy was that you get down under, under the, into the salt mine, literally, and it, most of the salt is not the kind we eat at the table, but the kind we use on our roads, um, the, the salt mine is now completely mined out except that they leave pillars in the salt mine to hold the rest of the county up basically right. and uh, although i i didn't do it myself but a lawyer that uh was in my firm did do this where he went down in the salt mine two miles and down in the salt mine they actually have jeeps and trucks that run around right down there under the under the salt and they're very worried that that uh, fracking uh you know the way they do it they you know hold the count the, those two counties up but but if somebody fracks nearby they could destroy the entire salt mine okay because it's it's just swiss cheese down there and you're basically and, living on top of a bridge and even right. the Jeep and the trucks, the harmonics of the vibrations could shake in cracks, right. depending on so those I, pillars are actually trusting the Swiss cheese. Right. Or are so just I think the hunting. salt miners pretty much have it under control, but the frackers, when they come in and start blowing things up, they're creating fissures in the earth. And if they create a fissure that contaminates the mine, they're going to contaminate everything under the the two counties and so it's a non-trivial issue and um and those blasts weren't factored into the quote-unquote bridge design trusting those pillars to right. the top plate of the bottom of the town that's right when god made that that salt that salt bed <laughs> he didn't figure on fracking right <laughs> right right, right. And, yeah so anyway let's let's go on so 936 is yours okay 936 the seat of astrological synchronicity is not in the planets but in the earth not in matter but in the anima telluris, therefore a certain kind of natural or living power in bodies has a certain divine similitude. Continuing 937, such was the intellectual background when Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, 1646 to 1716, appeared with his idea of pre-established harmony, that is, an absolute synchronism of psychic and physical events. This theory, theory finally petered out in the concept of psychological parallelism. Leibniz pre-established harmony and the above mentioned idea of Schopenhauer's that the unity of the primal cause produces a simultaneity and interrelationship of events, not in themselves causally connected, are at bottom only a repetition of the old peri 
peripatetic view with a modern deterministic coloring in the case of Schopenhauer and a partial replacement of causes, causality by an antecedent order in the case of Leibniz. For him, God is the creator of order. He compares soul and body to two synchronized clocks. He said from, in a footnote, from the beginning, God has made each of these two substances of such a nature that merely by following its own peculiar laws received with its being, it nevertheless accords with the other, just as if there were a mutual influence or as if God always put his hand there to, in addition to his general cooperation. Which he does. So, which he does. Yeah. And um, he goes, this is mostly Latin translation below, so I'll skip that part in the remainder of the footnote. Um, other than Leibniz took his idea of synchronized clocks from the Flemish philosopher Arnold Guelings. So, um, compares the soul, he compares the soul and body to two synchronized clocks and uses the same simile to express the relations of the monads or entelechies with one another. Although the monads cannot influence one another directly because as he says, they in quote, have no windows, relative evolution of causality. They are so con constituted they're so constituted that they are always in accord without having knowledge of one another. He conceives each monad to be, in quotes, a little world or, in quotes, active indivisible, active indivisible mirror, close quotes. Not only is man a microcosm, including the whole in itself, but every entelechy or monad is in effect such a microcosm. Each, in quotes, simple substance, has connections, in quotes, which express all the others, close quotes. It is a, in quotes, a perpetual living mirror of the universe, close quotes. He calls the monads of living organisms souls. The soul follows its own laws and the body its own likewise. And they accord by virtue of the Hana Permini pre-established among all substances, since they are representations of one and the same universe. This clearly express, expresses the idea that man is a microcosm. In quotes, souls in general, says Leibniz, are the living mirrors or images of the universe of created things. He distinguishes between minds on the one hand, which are images of the divinity capable of knowing the system of the universe and of imitating of it by architectonic pattern, patterns, each mind being as it were a little divinity in its own department and bodies on the other hand which act according to laws of efficient causes by emotion by motion <clears throat> while the souls act according to the laws of final causes by appetitions ends and means in the monad or soul alterations take place <clears throat> whose cause it be in quotes appetition which I would say that uh, I'm not going to try to define the word because I'm trying to go to appetite, but I think it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, the passing state, which involves and represents a plurality within the unity or simple substance, is nothing other than what is called perception, says Leibniz. Perception is, in quotes, the inner state of the monad representing external things, and it must be distinguished from compass conscious a perception for perception is unconscious herein lay the great mistake of the cartesians that they took no account of perceptions which are not a perceived the perceptive faculty of the monad corresponds to the in italics knowledge and its appetitive faculty or appetitive faculty to the will that is in god Okay, so I think what is happening here to those gentlemen is that they were still trying to uh, squeeze their observations into a box that they called God, and they thought they knew what God was. And um, 
And the reality is that at this point in the development of the human species, uh, we understand that every atom in the universe is related to every other atom in the universe. And so uh, there, there ain't no God like, like the religions uh, envisioned, uh, at least after the Big Bang. There might be something outside the Big Bang that is way bigger than any of us have a concept of and probably ever will have. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that, that yes, things cause other things uh, throughout the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, I can get a, a uh, idea that I'm going to shave off my mustache. And, you know, that is not disconnected to... Um, anything else in the universe, even after I shave it off, right? It's still there. Everybody remembers it, right? And, uh, or if Jordan were to shave off his beard, everybody would remember it and probably see the beard on Jordan's face, even if he shaved it off. So what's the point, right? And so anyway, uh, well, and so I think you bring the point there of what's, um, the, the concept of non-local mind, that if you have two electrons that come in contact or proximity magnetically, quote unquote, aware of each other, um, simply influenced by one another, and then you move those, those two far, far apart, well, if you change the spin on one, it changes the spin on the other. So there's this ability to, even though it's a perceived, not perceived, um, the one can affect the other. Yeah, without any um, right, and experience. yeah, there are interesting comments here. Uh, MPG says there's a Korean drama called Alchemy of Souls, and if you compare it to human life, we as humans waste ninety percent of our energies going out, and we never curate any energy coming in. We literally forgo it. And Susan says. I had not considered how out of balance the energy input and output we have as humans. And, you know, obviously that's a critical issue, which will be more and more considered in the future. Um, and, and I think that's, that goes back to that comment about how the collective will be more difficult as we move along. Because right now it, fe it feels like everything is dandelion -y. You know, you get the yellow flower and then it makes a little seed ball and then you blow it, poof. Every time I see this, I can think vitreous or non-vitreous clay. Oh, or is it formed by something else? And then the paint, and is it, is it you know, uh, volatile organic chemicals, the VOC, or is it healthy paint? And then, oh, it's black. No, not really anymore. It's kind of a multiple shades of gray because it's faded. Mm -hmm. But when all this, in information just is like a dandelion thing every time i feel like a lot of people look at things it's one problem with having so much information disinformation a information non-information good information in the news because what happens is every time you look at something it blows up in this dandelion seed it goes everywhere and it's completely distracting if someone doesn't understand just to look over and go mm, not now and turn away from it it's because i think we like in the movies, when you see the super genius who's thinking about something, and there are all these differential equations and math formulas floating around in the air representing the thoughts going on. Well, it feels like people will, you know, they open up this thing, you know, and, and immediately, poof. It, it's like it makes some, some people indecisive because then they can't leave because there's too much there. And it, it can impede the ability in some people to actually keep do focused. anything you yeah. do anything so the dandelion right. seed goes everywhere and now oh look at all the new yellow flowers i gotta follow <laughs> you know it's like no 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 well, no, no. Just it's it's uh you know the i i think of the title of the movie looking for mr goodbar everybody's mm -hmm. staring at their cell phone looking yeah. for for something that's going to make their life better presumably in one way or another right. 
and and we have a horrible problem in schools because from the sixth grade on at least kids have a cell phone with them and you can't take them away from it uh, because their parents insist that they have a cell phone available in case there's a uh, in the off chance that there might be a shooter. <laughs> and and uh, as a result, uh, we're, we're constantly trying to get their attention back on understanding the, the foundation that will make what they find on the cell phone meaningful. Right. And, <clears throat> and so... Uh, it's a it's a constant process now. Uh, in middle school, we're fairly good about um, making it against the rules to have your cell phone out. But in high school, that's totally ineffective. Everybody has their cell phone out. And well, so the problem you... is this, you know, the Black Mirror, as it's been called, and that's one that one series. Um, there's a Linus blanket crutch of a poison drip that they can't get off of and they've they've done studies too if you take someone's phone away just boom they'll literally have withdrawal symptoms just like an addict you know and and patrick says cell phones should be outlawed in schools no reason for them but that's um but in fact uh they are outlawed in the schools of my county I mean, they're they're not allowed to use them, but uh, just try to stop high school students from uh, using their cell phones, and good luck to you. And, well, and also and the may you print- survive until tomorrow. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, and I see a legitimate conflict <laughs> between the I can know everything control. Versus yeah. I don't control my car. I navigate my car through the unknown. If I don't know right. what's going to happen on the road. <clears throat> but if I contrast that with parental concern, parental responsibility, parental care, and parental anxiety, there's yeah. this, oh, are they okay? Are they, are, well, it becomes like the kid in the back seat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you turn around and stop the car and go, no. And if you don't stop that, we're going to drive back 17 states. I didn't want to go on this trip anyway, you know, (laughs) you know. And so it's the kind of thing to me where this can amplify anxiety because you are able to know. So there's an ethical piece of, well, yeah, I'm able to. But should I always constantly only try to know? And it's like, let go. And in a sense, it's kind of like pre-practice for how to let a kid go out of the nest. You know, I mean, my, my friend Kushbu, I had a chat with earlier, has joined us now. Um, yeah, I, I've come to the conclusion that maybe high school has become irrelevant. And maybe what we should do is uh, take people up through middle middle school and then give everybody an iPhone and let them fend for themselves. That <laughs> so would probably be more effective or as effective. Uh, because they'll find what they need for their life. Um, and that would actually, cre- it would serve to utilize directly a Iranian growth principle that would then lead to technological and other new structures being formed that, you know, for some of them would be disastrous and for some of them would be sure. wondrous. And for some of them, they would be relatively inert because they just can't, they just can't figure what to do on their own i mean there'll be all kinds of different systems right and that brings back another kind of nature you know and how how things perform in a system where everything is given free reign yeah uh society would go on in that case and you know i'm not saying that universities should change what they do uh Mm -hmm. because in university, you know, you're paying a lot of money for the information you're getting in in class. And so there's a big cost to ignoring it. And and um, and so, you know, just let let freedom ring and let, let give those students that those four years to learn for themselves through their own device. 
and then try to get into university and those that can will and those that can't won't um well and i think that the the merit the big merit i see of that is it will take the anxiety of instead of learning there's more constant testing now which is for tax reasons and funding reasons for the school rather than for the robust education principle of the students and what happens is that then people can at their own pace they move through and and it's not that they get failed no if they're interested in something they'll keep at it until they succeed it takes some longer than others but then that pace is not shamed it's actually accentuated based on oh well this is how fast i learn this stuff and i know that so i'm going to take more time or i learned this really quickly so I'm going to do that last or first because it only takes a little bit of time. And right. I, I mean, you can give people, you know, this is what you need to be able to come to these, this university. Uh, you can you can learn it through your iPhone or you can learn it in school. But one way or another that you're going to have have to have that in order to get into university. And that if you whether or not you get in is a determiner determiner of whether you have a successful life. On the other hand, there are plenty of jobs like plumber, electrician, or um, even uh, automobile repair, where you can make way more money than a law f- lawyer does, <laughs> and or even a business executive. And, uh, you know, you can decide to, to go that way. And it, it works just as well for a happy life and so you know but you know all these things are connected and kids get to the point at about the end of the eighth grade where you know they're they're in that they're feeling their oats because they're passing puberty and you know you're not getting through to them anyway really Mm. Honestly. Well, in, in native cultures, they would have been on the land their whole life. And so at that point, they begin to explore on their own more further, you know, right. or, or longer and di- greater distances. But what's interesting, I just thought about it. This example you give, like eighth grade, give them one of these, is it really is a direct correlation to, you know, give, them, give a person a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach him how to fish, and they'll, they'll eat for their whole life. So in a sense, it's here. All you, I'm going to t- teach you something. www. Dot, now put whatever else you want. Now go fish it. You know, and so you fish the internet in a way, and you learn and find what are your good pockets of information, or you know where are the fish biting. What's which would be akin to you know what's of interest to you, and that's a that's a, I think that's a pretty mighty proposal. Yeah. Um, so any, anyway, um, MG, MPG says uh, what Jordan said about flowers and cell phones is correct in terms of a network spreading out. Uh, what we as a society allow to grow and permeate our lives is crucial, but we're not aware of it till it's too late. Then at some point we realize there's no one doing it now. Hence, taking the cell phone away, withdrawal happens. And, you know, as we know, um, you know, the the question is whether you do something actively or passively. And, you know, if you do something actively, you're going to definitely constellate a reaction. Uh, And so there's been a discussion in our organizers group of whether we should be activists active or uh, we should be passive and you know I've learned through painful experience that if you're active even if you don't know you're being active there's going to be a a reaction both positive and negative whereas if you do something passively it might pass through and have an effect Um, and, and so we're hard-headed beings, basically. Um, you know, I get, con- I get accused of being a hard-headed Dutchman sometimes, usually by myself. Uh, but but the, tra- the, the reality is that we're all knuckleheads. 
and uh, mm-hmm. we all have our our mistakes. And the issue came up this week. You know, how do you teach children about mistakes? And I said, well, you know, in in business, I always ask one question of a person that I'm going to employ. What's the biggest mistake you ever made? Mm-hmm. And if they respond with a small mistake, I know they're lying to me and they'll probably lie to me once they're an employee. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, if they tell me a big mistake, then likely, you know, they might be okay as an employee. But then I have a, a dictum within anything that I lead, which is if you're not making a mistake every day, you're not trying hard enough. And, and yeah, you make as many mistakes as you can as fast as possible yeah, while not right. lo- like while not losing ground and right. make mistakes that you can afford to make and make a couple that you can't afford to make. So you understand how not to dip into that pothole again. Right. I mean, right. It, it reminds yeah. me of Churchill interviewing cabinet members where a, a guy sits down and he says, OK, tell me about your vices. And. Well, Mr. Churchill, uh, I'm an upstanding gentleman. I have no vices. And Churchill just laughs and laughs. He said, either you are that boring or you're a liar. And I can have neither of those two qualities on my cabinet. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let us go on here. So um, 958. Uh, it is clear from these. That's the one I'm on, right? 958. Yeah. 938. Right. 938. I'm sorry. I'm Actually, really quickly, the comment about the spider webbing, you know, the dandelion of the network spreading out and then basically implying then you'll have choking vines and overgrowth, you know, right. before it's too late or, you know, until it's too late, you can't change it. I remember gardening and a neighbor came by and I said, you know, I'm just trying to get rid of this bindweed back here because it just keeps coming up. And they're like, well, I'll show you how to deal with the, the big ones, but let me walk you over here. Now look at that. And there's a little sprout with two leaves that has kind of a little bit of a point. And then another sprout that has two almost identical leaves, except it has a curve instead of a point at the end of the leaf. And they said, one of those is bindweed. And if you can identify them by the leaf structure, right when they sprout, you just pick them up and throw them in the trash, pick them up and throw them in the trash. That should be your weeding ritual. And little by little, I learned to identify things by their basically infant leaf structure. Mm-hmm. And then I wasn't having to dig out a tap root that, you know, I'm probably going to have to pour gasoline down and burn. I don't want to do that because then that, to- you know, that poisons my garden right. and so or salt or what have you. But um, it was interesting about those until, you know, you, we don't notice until it's too late. I find that gardening principle sometimes is I look down. And it's all alluvium. And before I even start, I say, "Uh, uh-uh, that's not a value to me. That's a value back to the bottom of the riverbed. Right. Pour it out. Or look I, at the gold nugget. Let's take that. Yeah, actually, uh, a lot of these lessons are contained in the movie The Martian, which Deb and yeah. I watched again because Geneva loves this, this movie. And uh, it reminds me of The Martian, who who is... Um, uh, Matt Damon and he's uh, trying to grow potatoes and uh, it, these little shoots come up just like you're describing yeah. uh, and then when he's finally saved he's sitting on a bench on the earth and he sees the little uh, creature emerging in the form of, of the, uh, the leaves and uh, You know, these lessons are very well taught in that Mm -hmm. movie. It's it's amazing. Yeah, Um, that whole greenhouse sequence of him discovering how to then create this little microcosm of an environment where like Earth in a in a a bubble. Right. So if if to our audience, if you've not seen the movie The Martian, uh, it's about an astronaut who's left behind on Mars. And uh, NASA has to save him and tries to save him, does save him, but only after uh, about three years or something like that. It takes three years to rescue him. And uh, 
he's actually rescued by the people who leave who left him behind in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but that that's probably a, a, something I shouldn't have said because of spoiler. But, spoiler <laughs> alert! But no, nonetheless, um, yeah. It's a wonderful movie, and it has a lot of these lessons in it. All right, so let's move on, because these guys had ideas of humans hundreds of years ago, and so uh, we we can't dwell on them too much. They're 938, right? It is clear from these quotations that besides the causal connection, Leibniz postulates a complete pre-established parallelism of events both inside and outside the monad. The synchronicity principle thus becomes the absolute rule in all cases where an inner event occurs simultaneously with an outside one. As against this, however, it must be borne in mind that the synchronistic phenomena, which can be verified empirically, far from constituting a rule, are so exceptional that most people doubt their existence. They certainly occur, much more frequently in reality than one thinks or can prove, but we can still, we we still do not know whether they occur as frequently or so regularly in any field of experience that we could speak of them as conforming to law. We only know that there must be an underlying principle which might possibly explain all such related phenomena. Okay, so Jordan, you, you can go on. I'm going to take a short break. Okay, paragraph 930. Actually, let me read the footnote from that paragraph um, that Jung says, I must again stress the possibility that the relation between body and soul may yet be understood as a synchronistic one. Should this conjecture ever be proved, my present view that synchronicity is a relatively rare phenomenon would have to be corrected. And that's, he lo- refers to Meyer's observations in Zeitgeist Problem, the Transformation, which would be the, in a sense, Zeitgeist or comprehensivism of the problem of transformation. Um, paragraph 939, the primitive, <clears throat> as well as the classical and media- medieval views of nature, postulate the existence of some such principle along causality, even in Leibniz, Causality is neither the only view nor the prom- predominant one. Then, in the course of the 18th century, it became the exclusive principle of natural science. With the rise of the physical sciences in the 19th century, the correspondence theory vanished completely from the surface, and the magical world of earlier ages seemed to have disappeared once and for all until, towards the end of the century, the founders of the Society for Psychical Research indirectly opened up the whole question again through their investigation of telepathic phenomena. Continuing paragraph 940, the medieval attitude of mind I have described above underlies all the magical and mantic procedures which have played an important part in people's humanity's life since the remotest times. The medieval mind would regard Rhine's laboratory arranged experiments as magical performances, whose effect for this reason would not seem so very astonishing. It was interpreted as a quote unquote transmission of energy, which is still commonly the case today. Although as I have said, it is not possible possible to form any empirically verifiable conception of the transmitting medium. Paragraph 941, I need hardly point out that for the primitive mind, synchronicity is a self-evident fact. Consequently, at this stage, there is no such thing as chance. No accident, no illness, no death is ever fortuitous or attributable to natural causes. Everything is somehow due to magical influence. The crocodile that catches a person while he is bathing or while they are bathing has been sent by a magician illness is caused by some spirit or other some spirit or other the snake that was seen by the grave of someone's body someone's somebody's mother is obviously not or is obviously her soul etc on the primitive level of course 
Synchronicity, synchronicity does not appear as an idea by itself, but as magical causality. This is an early form of our classical idea of causality. While the development of Chinese philosophy produced from the significance of the magical, the concept of Tao, the, of meaningful coincidence, but no causality based science. Synchronicity, paragraph 942, synchronicity postulates a meaning which is a priori or in advance of pre, and already pre existing before something occurs in, rel in relation to human consciousness and apparently exists outside and. Such an assumption is found above all in the philosophy of Plato, which takes for granted the existence of transcendental images or models of empirical beings, the forms and species whose reflections we see in the phenomenal world. This assumption not only presented no difficulty to earlier centuries, but was on the contrary, perfectly self-evident. The idea of an a priori meaning may also be found in the older mathematics, as in the math mathematician Jacobi's paraphrase of Schiller's poem, Archimedes of his pupil. He praises the calculation of the orbit of Uranus and closes with the lines, what you behold in the cosmos is only the light of God's glory. In the Olympian host, number eternally reigns. So I read through up to paragraph 942. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I don't think that really needs much further elucidation. No, and we have a, a little over one one or two pages to read and yes, to get right to through. the conclusion. So let us press on and maybe we can do it with some commentary. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, 943. The great mathematician Gauss is the putative author of the saying, God arithmetizes. 944, the idea of synchronicity and of self-subsistent meaning, which forms the basis of classical Chinese thinking and of the naive views of the Middle Ages, seems to us an archaic assumption, assumption that ought at all costs to be avoided. Though the West has done everything possible to discard this antiquated hypothesis, it has not, not quite succeeded. Certain mantic procedures seem to have died out, but astrology, which in our own day has attained an eminence never known before, remains very much alive nor has the determinism of a scientific epoch been able to extinguish altogether the persuasive power of the synchronicity principle. For in the last resort, it is not so much a question of superstition as of a truth which remained hidden for so long only because it had less to do with the physical side of events than with their psychic aspects. It was modern psychology and parapsychology which proved that causality does not explain a certain class of events, and that in this case, we have to consider a formal factor, name, namely synchronicity, as a principle of explanation. <clears throat> you want to go read on? Certainly. Paragraph 945. For those who are inter interested in psychology, I should like to mention here that the peculiar idea of a self-subsistent meaning is suggested in dreams. Once when this idea was being discussed in my circle, somebody remarked, the geometrical square does not occur in nature except in crystals. A lady who had been present had the following dream that night. In the garden, there was a large sand pit in which layers of rubbish had been deposited. In one of these <clears throat> layers, she discovered thin, slaty plates of green serpentine. One of them had black squares on it, arranged concentrically. The black was not painted on, but was ingrained in the stone, like the markings in an agate. Similar marks were found on two or three other plates, which Mr. A, a slight acquaintance, then took away from her. Another dream motif of the same kind is the following. 
The dreamer was in a wild mountain region where he found contiguous layers of Triassic rock. He loosened the slabs and discovered to his boundless astonishment that they had human heads on them in low relief. This dream was repeated several times <clears throat> at long intervals. Another time the dreamer was traveling through the Siberian tundra and found an animal he had long been looking for. It was more than it was it was a more than life-size cock made of what looked like thin colorless glass, but it was alive and had just sprung by chance from a microscopic unicellular organism, which had the power to turn into all sorts of animals, not otherwise found in the tundra, or even into objects of human use of whatever size. The next moment, each of these chance forms vanished without trace. Here is another dream of the same type. The dreamer was walking in a wounded, uh, walking in a wooded mountain region. At the top of a steep slope, he came to a ridge of rock honeycombed with holes. There he found a little brown man of the same color as the iron oxide, which the rock was coated. The little man was busily engaged in hollowing out a cave at the back of which a cluster of columns could be seen in the living rock. On the top of each column was a dark brown human head with large eyes carved with great care out of some very hard stone like lignite. The little man freed this, for, freed this formation from the amorph, amorphous conglomerate surrounding it. The dreamer could hardly believe his eyes at first but then had to admit that the columns were continued far back into the living rock and must therefore have come into existence without the help of man. He reflected that the rock was at least half a million years old and that the artifact could not possibly have been made by human hands. <laughs> in, the, in the final paragraph, these dreams seem to point to the presence of a formal factor in nature. They describe not just a lucis nature but the meaningful coincidence of an absolutely natural product with a human idea apparently independent of it. This is what the dreams are obviously saying and what they are trying to bring nearer to consciousness through repetition. And his footnote of number 77, those who find the dreams unintelligible will probably suspect them of harboring quite a different meaning, which is more in accord with their preconceived opinions. One can indulge in wishful thinking about dreams just as one can about anything else. For my part, I prefer to keep as close to the dream statement as possible and to try to formulate it in accordance with its manifest meaning. If it proves impossible to relate this meaning to the conscious situation of the dreamer, then I frankly admit that I do not understand the dream, but I take good care not to juggle it into line with some preconceived theory. Oh, boy. Beautiful. A final shot against Freud. <laughs> yeah, well, completely. And it also, with the crystals and nature and then the independent idea, it actually reminds me of concrete because concrete doesn't dry. It mm -hmm. actually cures. And you can't see through it, but it's a crystal, a crystalline right. lattice structure. Those, it actually forms into hexagonal or hexagon um, crystals. And they tie each other together and intersect to create the, the what would be the, um, the lattice structure or crystalline lattice structure of the material concrete. And so when you look down, I mean, there's two kinds of concrete, concrete that's cracked and concrete that's going to crack. I mean, that's just how it works so that you joint it properly and you break it up properly in the design of its shapes. But... If you look down at the sidewalk when you're walking around and you see concrete that's cracking, not necessarily just the spalling where the top flakes off, just take a look and you'll probably see more 60 and 120 degree and 30 degree angles that are tracking the average of most of the cracks will split off at 60, 120 and 30 degree angles. And mm. that's because the hexagon is breaking up in crystal pieces 
and mm. small, medium, and large. And so depending on the size of the aggregate inside, how those crystals bind, you know, to, to connect to that, basically the aggregate, the gravel or the rocks, give that lattice structure something to bridge from and to to one another to actually connect. So those the aggregate create little nodes or knots where all these structures come together to hold. And so I find that so interesting. You can, you know, walking down the sidewalk, you can have a nice little field trip of numbers just looking down and nope, 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 bad mixture. There's there's hardly any 60 degree angles like, oh, they didn't take care of the bleed water properly. Um, but if you get it and you see the cracks, like, wow, what a great mixture. And you can do a forensic just by visual of sure. look at those 60 degree angles. This is really good concrete. Right. And the other thing that that proves is the, the truth of what I learned in my business over the years, which is that when people are pouring concrete as in a as in a roadway, for example, they intentionally introduce cracks. Yes. Uh, so my company made a product called Crack Inducer. And, and, <laughs> and so when con concrete was being poured into forms, then you would put Crack Inducer next to it, uh, which was a piece of plastic, which when the, the forces on the concrete would have cracked because for one reason or another the the crack inducer would be the weak point and it would allow the crack to be in one way and not just jaggedly across the concrete and so it would stay in like squares so that's why you hear the bum 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 bum, bum as you're going yeah. along on a car that's on a road feet. that yeah, every uh, every so often, if you're on a concrete road, you'll hear that bum 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 from your from your tires, and that's because they've induced crack. And uh, if they hadn't done that, uh, then the the road would be cracked every which way but loose, and then you'd be hearing bum 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 bum. bum. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, and, and also too, they'll do intermittent intermittent pouring where they'll do this one, skip a skip a bay. And this one, skip a bay. And then after that's cured, they go back and just without any jointing, pour the concrete in against the concrete. The problem with that, though, is as they move, the concrete breaks the concrete. And then, you know, yeah. it compresses right. it against it. So when you have that, that joint, the plastic is able to be compressed and expand and contract. And that keeps that keeps the integrity of the shape intact. So you don't have so much bum, 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 bum. Right. And that way they can move. But the thing is, you are driving on a highway across a, a, a segmented surface, not going right. the direction you're going, going, you know, transverse or perpendicular to your direction. Right. So believe it or not, we still have another 26 pages in this book, which include a uh, conclusion and then another addendum, which is, again, called synchronicity, I think. Uh, it's called uh, yeah, unsynchroni it's unsynchronicity. So we will read the conclusion next week. And yeah. uh, the following week, we'll start on this on synchronicity. We're going to blast through these last two sections because we've we've given synchronicity the time that it deserves. And I think we yeah. need to move on. Uh, and uh I've been thinking about it, and I think that uh, we would do well to do the Red Book, okay, with our commentary on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and I'm not talking about the Black Books, which are even deeper, uh, mm -hmm. because most people haven't even given the Red Book a, a serious read, and so... Um, I have done over many years, given the Red Book, a very serious read. And, and now the Black Books, I have only one volume to go. And, um, and both are profound, but I think we start at the, at the Red Book stage and talk about what the meanings of what is happening to Dr. Jung in those, in those phases is useful. And, um, and, uh, 
And the answer to MPG's question is the the next book will be the the red book, which is called also called Liber Novus. Um, just put it into any Google, and you'll find this. <laughs> the red book by C.G. Young, because he doesn't seem to be familiar with this. Um, and I'm this week. I think Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday. I've got a basically a book order. I've been putting together on Amazon that I'm going to place and I'm going to rebuy the red book. Cause that was, you know, in one of those wonderful boxes that just didn't make it to here. Yeah. So, well, it's, I, I, I urge you to buy the reader's edition uh, first, at least so that you have it for this purpose, because uh, the large one is too cumbersome to use online. Um, well, and, I get that, but I mean, for me, so visual, the red book I need to replace. And before I didn't have the reader's edition because I almost didn't need it, but now it's, it makes it even more robust. So yeah. I'm just going to put both of them in. And so by the time mm -hmm. we get there, I'll, I should have received right. them. And, and Susan says it would be so happy if we do the red book. I would be so happy if we do the red book. Okay. So yeah. I think that that's, uh, that's a definite thing for 2023. And uh, we still have a, a couple more weeks going in uh, 22. So we'll probably actually start in 22, uh, unless something well, comes up. It's kind of, it's nice because we did Answer to Job and Synchronicity, which are kind of like tight little European city streets that we took a nice long time, slowly, right. cafes and experiences. And then the Red Book, now we're going to open up on this big urban plaza and this, you know, more robust visual yeah. thing that is not, you know, two of his smaller segmented pieces from the bigger pieces. It's actually the bigger piece. So okay, let, let me just add, we're at the 11th. We will do next week, which will finish this forerunners of synchronicity with the exception. With, so we'll do the conclusion next week. And uh, then we're going to take Christmas Day off. Uh, because um, I'm going to be visiting one of my daughters on Christmas Day, and uh, I don't want to be having to do a, a session on Christmas Day. So there will be one week hiatus. I think if you're if you think you'll be sober on January first, we can we can do the um, we can do the other synchronicity piece that day if you want or we can wait until the eighth yeah think? that's that's fine because actually january 1st i'm gonna i'm probably gonna run a special out on the plaza kind of thing so um, yeah and so i mean after this then i'll head out there so um what's nice is you know on sunday mornings now during the winter i mean i wouldn't be there right now anyway because mm -hmm. it's still probably it's, i don't know but it's probably still 28 degrees or less or yeah. and it'll get up towards 40 so i think new year's day is It'd be a great, it actually, it'll be actually kind of a perfect day to finish up. You know, we segue so just right into the new year and then tie off and then we move on the next right. week. To the next. So quarter. we'll probably start the red book on the 8th of January is what I guess. Okay. Um, and um, in the, in the meantime, we'll knock off these last two sections. Um, it, what we'll do on the 18th, we'll do the conclusion, which is next week. And then on on New Year's Day, we'll do this other piece and finish off 25 pages in two sessions, which will be a lot. But if we if we consider that we've given ample time to synchronicity, yeah. <laughs> I think we can move on. And well, and I also think, too, I think in regards to January first, I'm I'm most likely going to be doing um, end of year, going into next year sessions, like for the New Year's Eve. People often it's a great time for people to reflect and also look forward. So honestly, we had our Bent Street bonfires last night, and it was cool. Except just like unlike last year, I didn't stay for three hours after they took the fires down where I couldn't feel my feet and uh, there came there came a point when I went well don't tell me the temperature because then I'll start getting cold I'm just deep breathing while I'm going but 
you know, it was continuous from one o'clock to one thirty to nine fifteen, mm-hmm. and the, the seat was not empty. There were people. No, I'm next. No, I'm next. No. So there was more the you know people haggling in the line. Fortunately, politely. Um, well, that that would be a good thing to do on New Year's Eve for sure. Yeah, and so mm-hmm. last night was just a great model of it because <clears throat> what happens is on on December 10th each year or right there around before the solstice when we do the Ben Street bonfires, that's that's a night that or a whole day where I read for free, and mm-hmm. you know tips appreciated. But it's it's funny with the tips I still usually make about the same amount, but it's just continuous and smaller. Um, but that's not the point. It's the day I can give back. Yeah. You know. And people came in and yesterday it was so funny because I had the tip basket, right? And it says tips on the top and it's a nice basket, but I made this little sign inside and it said, if you fear change, leave yours here. So- <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so yeah, oh, that is funny. Eve, I'll probably be doing that. So I think New Year's morning, I'll probably unfortunately be more fine than I want to be. It's like, oh, well, I'm bright and bushy. Well, have, you, have you bought some of these overhead heaters yet? No, I, but I got heated seat cushions. Uh-huh. And then after I received those, I signed up for their ads and their heated gloves and their um, rechargeable heated socks and so what's interesting, the heated seats are a hit. Some people are like, well, can we keep going? I'm like, you don't want more of a reading. You just want your butt warm. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> like, it's like heated seats in the car. It's like, I don't want to go to the grocery store. I just drive to sit in the parking lot with my heated seat and then drive back home and forget the food because I stayed warm. Right. Um, but yeah, I've, I've looked at them. I got a, a ring light that can fit up under the post of my umbrella that has like 24 LEDs. So the light piece, but I'm looking for something that's not really intrusive, but that I can mount under the table that keeps the table itself warm and then something near so that it makes kind of a a space that is like a warm bubble. Um, But so I haven't I haven't jumped on purchasing the the out external heater pieces. Just I haven't found the right one. And I know there's I know what I'm looking for kind of non-intrusive not the big gas vertical okay but you would have to use batteries is that right yeah and rechargeable you know, because i don't want to i don't want to have a cord all the way across or propane i really don't want to use propane because that yeah. sitting next to a tank with uh, it's just that right. seems to be a little bit out of my acceptable risk level <laughs> okay that's um, fair enough you know. um okay so uh, uh Everybody knows what we have to get uh, yep. Jordan for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about uh, Taos, New Mexico, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. So if you happen to be in Taos, New, New Mexico over the holidays, uh, you will find Jordan in the plaza. Would you say where that is? Jordan's it's the John Dunshops Plaza. There's a main plaza square where the Hotel La Fonda and a lot of great shops and the the gorge bar and grill restaurant is and then you just walk up some brick cobble sidewalks that are wide up past a store called chocola which has liquid sipping chocolate among other amazing things Uh, the joke is some people are never leave they just sit in the corner like this smiling like more (laughs) and then the manzanita cafe um, you pass that and then you come up into what's called the John Dunn, D-U-N-N shops. And he was a, a really rarefied, you know, eccentric historical figure here, um, local um, barkeep and property owner and rancher and horse thief and gambler and banker, you know, so, he, mm-hmm. you know, he kind of... He was Wild West. Well, they, they they will one day say that of you, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, only, if only. But but, um, it, but it's nice that you it's nice that you found a niche that works well for you. I'm I'm delighted to see that. Well, um, thank you. You know what's interesting is LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter years back. I would always perplexed. I never got any referrals or any clients from any of the social media platforms. 
Mm-hmm. What's interesting, though, that's because I wasn't being me. And not that that being me would have done it there. What happened is here, I just show up to my office with no walls. And there you go. It just word gets around and people show up. And so it's it's real time. And what's interesting for me is that social media does not work for my particular business, no matter what. I mean, I've taken yeah. courses and what it is, is that it's a real time experience. And so I appreciate that, Skip, because really? coming here, I know, is such a big place and going to the you know tumultuous, rumbly four wheel drive passage of the end part of um, Philadelphia for me. Um, it, it's interesting because it's like I came out of the dark clouds and right into the sun and went, oh, it's not so bad. It's I don't have to do all those things. And I basically systematically, you know, carved off to get to what it is that I do. And my mom laughs. She's like, oh, yeah, look at the architect who now has an office with no walls. And there's the whole infrastructure is a deck of cards, this and a little bitty square reader that's wireless. And, you know, tap it or put your card in and there you go. And the architect in me would have never thought that my infrastructure could be carried in my shirt pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So, thank you. Well, I'll tell you what, don't buy, don't buy yourself a, a reader's edition. I will see to that for your, for oh, your thank you. holiday gift. And uh, so you, if you want the other one, that's that's for your account. But yeah, that's, the reader's that's, edition that's, for this purpose will... I'll, Go hopping around to find the right price because I'll be cover that. I, I mean, I'm trying to think. Think how could I get get you a, a heater with some sort of heater? But um, but the the red book is the the reader's edition is the right thing for you. Um, and so that will be your Christmas gift this nice. year. And uh, I will systematically forget that and be wonderfully surprised. <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll do my best. I have to fit it into my cash flow, but um, no, I, I, I understand fully. But uh, certainly, you deserve it, and we need it in your hands for January 8th. And so, next week, we will have a session, we will not have a session on Christmas Day, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And so, we will finish this reading. Uh, on New Year's Day. Um, And uh, so we'll see you all then. And thank you for being here today. We had a wonderful chat and um, we still have 13 people listening. So that's uh, oh, wonderful, a wonderful result because when there are that many people right now simultaneously listening, it usually means we've had about 100 who've visited during the live stream and uh, typically that that multiplies in the week after we've done it to uh, 250, 300 hits for the first week after we've done one of these. So it's uh, it's good that we're getting the word out. Um, yeah, and thank you all for being there. And, and certainly I'm very grateful for all of our regulars, Patrick Hollywood, Susan Mason, uh, Justin... Uh, Justin, of course, is there, Richard Casper, um, and a few others, just in case I, I meant, and uh, uh, Art uh, Patterson is often here and is here, I think, today, uh, and many others who, uh, Kathy Kerr, uh, I very much appreciate your regular uh, mm-hmm. appearance. Thanks so much here and your comments and uh so let's keep and going miles, now one other that. thing the artemis spacecraft is landing in the pacific in the next 40 minutes and it's going to land in a different way from all other spacecraft which is that it's going to skip in the atmosphere and come down a second time about 75 miles to the west of san diego and so uh, it's a new trick that that uh, NASA is trying. They're trying it before they have astronauts in it to see if it right. works. And um, so it might be a monumental thing to be watching today. So I urge everybody to take a look at the NASA channel on YouTube, uh, where they will be covering it live. And uh, 
So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jordan, for being here. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. The Red Book in 2023. Bye.